what happened was that there were these councils to determine aqida correct aqida means what what's aqida tell me what does aqida mean khalik what's aqida belief it's actually your righteous belief aqida is righteous belief so at these councils that were had people wanted to determine what was righteous christian belief because there were a whole host of people around some people said jesus was man some people said jesus was never uh, born in the flesh he was spiritual being some people said jesus was both man and both god he was half man and half god some people said he was 100% god good day yusuf is here explaining a sort of arabic word which is aqida uh, which is sort of derived from a triconsonantal word akara which means to tie a knot and the impression is created that early christianity was quite diverse uh, i just want to before we start just quickly give you a definition once more of what the central issue was of the early Nicene Council. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Jane D. Kelly in his book Early Christian Doctrines writes the following on page 223 and he says this is the central issue of the Council of Nicaea. He says the theological issue at stake was or seems to be a much narrower one, the status of the word which is Jesus and his relation to the Godhead. He says, was he fully divine in the precise sense of the term and therefore really akin to the Father? Or was he after all creation superior no doubt to the rest of creation even by courtesy designated divine but all the same separated by the unabridgable chasm from the Godhead? What was the central issue at the Council of Nicaea? Let me say to you the very central or core issue at the Council of Nicaea was basically uh, the deity of Christ in opposing or in opposition to Arianism. The early Christian church already affirmed what they believed. When we look at the paradosis, when we look at the kerygma, when we look at that, we can see very early on that the church had a clue what they believed. Even the first century church fathers uh, uh, clearly stated that Jesus was divine. They even earlier stated that he was part of the Godhead. So, the Council of Nicaea did not determine that Jesus was God. It simply affirmed that Jesus was God. It was in 325. It was called the Council of Nicaea. That was in Iznik. It's in modern-day Turkey. At the Council of Nicaea, what had happened was that for the very first time, they made a decision that Jesus was decided to be God. Let me just say, to assert that Jesus only became God at the Council of Nicaea is absolutely oblivious to the historical fact of what we see in the early church. When we look at early church history, and I'll just recommend quickly two sort of resources to look at, and that is Seabuck's sort of textbook on history of early doctrines, and also uh, David Burkhardt, um, his sort of dictionary on early Christian beliefs, where they assert quite clearly that the early church fathers deemed Jesus to be God, and part of a triadic pattern, if I might add, because we're speaking of the Trinity. Uh, in the earliest letter of Barnabas in 74 on Domini, in letter, chap uh, letter number 5, it speaks of his pre-existence. Hermas, uh, in 88 on Domini, in his letter number 12, speaks of Christ being older than creation. Uh, Arist uh, Aristides, uh, in 140 on Domini, speaking of Jesus, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit being present. Justin Martyr, uh, we can go on and on, Polycarp of Smyrna, uh, Tatian of Syria. Um, and we can just go on and on where we can clearly see that the early church fathers clearly received that, that revelation from the earliest apostles declaring that Jesus was worshipped and that he was God. Uh, when you assert that at the Council of Nicaea only Jesus was determined to be God, number one, you deny the fact that the early church fathers historically already asserted what they've received from the apostolic fathers in declaring that Jesus was God. But secondly, what you do is you marring basically exactly what took place at the Council of Nicaea. After that, in 381, you had what was called the First Council of Constantinople. At the First Council of Constantinople, in response to the allegation that Jesus was simply God, they said, well, look, he's not just simply God, he's man and he's God. He has two natures. Yes, when we look at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, we can see that the early church uh, sort of brought a council together. This is the fourth major council or ecumenical council to sort of discuss the, the sort of uh, 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 the very thing that they held dearly and something that was already this, uh, sort of established and to clarify the doctrine that was discussed at the Council of, of Ephesus 
uh, which taught basically that Jesus is one person or one hypostasis uh, in two natures. Um, they took on uh, basically also the heresy called monophysicism. Monos being one and physis being a, a sort of one nature. Uh, and th there was basically uh, two views, uh, the one we've discussed already, it's called Apollinarianism, uh, and the other one is called Eutychianism. Eutychianism is basically taught and, and sort of believed that uh, sort of the, the humanity of Christ was absorbed by the divine, sort of like a drop uh, of water that, that fell in, into this great vast ocean, uh, being sort of, uh, uh, sort of absolutely absorbed by the greater whole. Um, let me just also say that finishing touches, so what? Uh, it, it does not mean that it was established. It just means that the Christians had to, uh, in lateral part of, of Christianity, and specifically the 4th century, had to give meaning to what they truly hold and truly believe. And uh, to their uh, disposal, there was uh, different ideas, different words that they could articulate what they truly believed. And I don't see a problem with that. Um, there's also specific things that we can recognize uh, very later on uh, with Muslim theologians like Avicenna and uh, and so forth and these guys also used uh, specific terms to describe what they believed about Allah but there's no contention that the doctrine of Tawheed was invented later uh, or you know at all uh, but we do know that there was an attempt obviously as language progressed to show what was meant uh, in this belief that they had about God. After that, in about 434, at the Council of Ephesus, they made a decision that Mary is described as Theotokos. Theotokos means the God-bearer. They couldn't have made her part of a trinity. Why not? Because in ancient society, women were held very low. They were dried down. In response to that, you had, a count, you had someone called Nestorius who stated that he denied that Mary could be called the mother of God. So to him, Mary was a mother of the human Jesus only. She can't be mother of a divine person. So you had, for example, the Council of Ephesus, which is what I mentioned. It decreed that the two natures of Jesus cannot be separated. It's not half-half. There are two natures which cannot be separated. Everything Jesus does is done by both the humanity in him and is done by both the divinity in him. Likewise, everything that happens to him happens to both the man and to both the God he is. Therefore, Mary gave birth to both. She gave, both died on the cross, etc. Yusuf mentions the uh, Council of Ephesus, which is the third council, which was convening in 431, not 433 like he's mentioned. And at the council, uh, the Emperor Theodosius II, uh, grandson of uh, Theodosius the Great, called this uh, meeting, this coming together to discuss um, this absolute heresy of Nestorianism. Nestorianism basically contended and held that um, Jesus uh, was two, two persons. Uh, there was the divine Son of God, uh, and then there was the man Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus was therefore not really God, but he was indwelled by the Logos or God, and he should be known sort of as the Theophoros, which is the barrier of God, uh, but not God. Uh, and then Mary should be called the Christotokos, Christotokos um, which is basically the barrier of Christ. Uh, and ultimately, the church asserted that she's the Theotokos, which is the mother of God. Um, let me just say that when you assert and when you say something like, uh, early, early triadic patterns uh, in ancient religions influenced the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, but Mary could not be included because there was such a low view of woman. Um, does not that sort of violate the whole idea that he, and sort of your very argument that you've made in the beginning when you said that um, there were sort of female participants in the doctrine of the early Trinities that you've mentioned, and now suddenly Mary is sort of not part of the Trinity. Uh, it's just sort of a a convoluted idea which is just abs absolutely not established on the principal facts of history. Let me also just say that when I look at what Yusuf is asserting about Mary um, and the early church not being able to make her God, I'm just absolutely disappointed. I think it's a low blow, I think it's unsubstantiated, and I think history does not show anywhere at all that Mary was ever to be considered to be God. Um, so. 
I just want to say that and just need to say that uh, we need to be fair to history, but we also need to be honest. And when we look at history honestly, we can see clearly that there was no mention of that. And yet you find, lastly, another council, the Council of Chalcedon in 451, basically it received some finishing touches. Yes, at the Council of Constantinople, uh, I think it was Pope, Pope, Pope Damascus, Pope Damascus, uh, and in 377, he basically outright just banished uh, the whole idea of Apollinarianism as, as a complete heresy. Uh, and then in 378, I think it's 379, he sort of put Basil in charge to sort of chart a, an idea or an understanding why this is heresy. And then in 381, we get the council that basically explains why Apollinarianism is sort of a heresy. The reason the Apollinarianism was seen as sort of a heresy was because Apollinarians basically held that Christ was sort of an ascetic. Uh, he, he had an appearance of human flesh, but he did not really have a, uh, a human flesh. Therefore, everything that Jesus achieved salvifically, therefore everything Jesus was as a man, everything he experienced as a man, his baptism as a man, etc., etc., was sort of done in his divinity and his humanity had absolutely uh, no realization of what was taking place. Uh, it makes just the biblical doctrine of soteriology of no effect and it fails to meet sort of the criteria of what the early church held in their position. Uh, as we see, Apollinarianism basically held the, the sort of idea that you, Jesus' divine will sort of, sort of overcame his human will and that is not what we view as being the orthodox understanding of the hypostatic union or the divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, many Christians are not aware or do not understand Jesus in the manner or the way that the creed was meant to or formulated to die, deny. I mean, many of us, you'd find, for example, some Christians would say Jesus is just the Son of God, but they don't understand Him in the absolute sense of God. Some would say, well, look, Jesus is not God. I mean, amongst many of us, many of our ordinary day-to-day -day Christians. So the orthodox doctrine is against the conventional belief of what many Christians believe in. So what, Joseph is right here, that a lot of Christians do not really understand or hold dearly, uh, as the early church, the understanding of the doctrine of Christ, nor the, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Let me just say that uh, it, it is just absolutely clear when Jesus speaks in, in scriptures like John 8 verse 23, where he says, unless you believe that I am he, uh, that you'll die in your sins, that there is a carnal importance of what we believe about God. Uh, I do not know of any Biblical Orthodox Christian that would deny the Trinity or that would assert that Jesus was not God. Uh, it is just so embedded and part of the fact that it's cannot, it just cannot be denied. I agree with Yusuf, there's a lot of Christians that, that, do not, that do not know the Biblical doctrine of the Trinity and I'm reminded of the words of Karl Rahner uh, when he said that the Trinity plays uh, in some Christians' life a very modest role uh, if it occurred at all in their epistemology and their basic understanding of Christ, uh, their Christian life and teaching uh, which they hear. But it does not mean that we deny the Biblical doctrine of the Trinity. And let me just also say, uh, I've got an upcoming debate and, uh, and we're going to basically debate the Biblical understanding of God versus the Quranic understanding of God. And I hope that my opponent uh, will give us a bit of an account for what he means when he speaks about uh, Tawhid. And what it means when he speaks about the, the, the oneness of Allah. Because a lot of times in these debates, the onus is put on Christians to give an account for what they believe in and to give an essential elements of how they delineate this thought. But very few Muslims that I've met can actually do quite the same with their own understanding of their own religion and their God. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But if you go back to the orthodox doctrine that Jesus is both God and he's both man, that would be logically impossible. Huston Smith, he's a scholar of comparative religion, and he says, Jesus cannot possess only, for orthodox doctrines, Jesus cannot possess only some human qualities, he must possess all, he must be fully human. At the same time, he cannot possess only some divine qualities, he must have all, he must be fully divine. This is impossible, because to be fully divine means one has to be free of human limitations. If one has only one human limitation, then he is not God. But according to the creed, he has every human limitation. How can he then be God? He says, we begin with the doctrine of incarnation, which took several centuries to fix. 
Holding as it does that in Christ God assumed a human body, it affirms that Christ was God man, not half God, half man, he was God man, simultaneously both fully God and fully man. If the doctrine held that Christ was half human and half divine, or that he was divine in certain respects, while being human in other respects, then of course we wouldn't have a problem. What the creed says is that he's fully divine and he's fully human. Now, this is a problem because as a human being, what's a quality? To be human means you are limited, correct? You lack knowledge. You are prone to mistakes. You are imperfect. To be God, on the other hand, means you are unlimited, you are complete in knowledge, you are infallible, you are perfect. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot say of one person that he is, he is um, limited and he is unlimited. He lacks knowledge and he has all the knowledge. It's like this, I mean, if someone were to say that someone is... Um, I mean, if you look at myself, I would probably be six foot, 1.84 meters. You cannot say, well, look, I am tall and I am short. I am fat and I am thin. I, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it because the quality of God is divine, it's absolute. The quality of man is limited, it's shallow. But according to the orthodox doctrine, Jesus was both. He was God, 100% God, and he was 100% man. When Yusuf speaks here of, um, he speaks first of all of a theologian called Hudson Smith, and um, interestingly to notice just that Hudson Smith is um, someone that compares religion. He's not someone that espouses on doctrine um, in his views. And to mention and say that Jesus being both God and man is impossible simply because if he has human attributes, basically that excludes divine attributes and the other way around, it is, I could understand why he sort of found himself saying it's problematic. And he makes the assertion, he says, to be the finest, to be absolutely free of human limitations. But we need to understand that the biblical doctrine of the Incarnation, if we read John 1, 14, and the word became flesh, that which was eternal, that which was uh, a God and with God, became flesh. We need to understand that Jesus became man. And Yusuf is sort of creating the impression that when he became man, that his, that his divinity was absorbed by his humanity. Um, it, it sounds familiar, it sounds almost like some of the early heresies which we've discussed. But ultimately, for the Christian understanding, we believe that when the Word became flesh, there's basically two contentions or two ideas that I just quickly want to discuss with you that took place. Uh, the first one is called what we call uh, unhypostasis. Hypostasis, um, you know, is, is sort of a, a Greek word, um, you know, that was used in the early church to describe personhood. And when we speak of unhypostasis, there's basically this prevailing idea that it, um, Jesus' humanity, and I want to read this to you uh, from Donald McLeod in his book, The Person of Christ, he speaks of that. He says the following, uh, uh, he says, uh, the divine person, without adopting an existing human person, took on our human nature and entered upon him the whole range of human experiences. Yet, Jesus took a fully human divine uh, or human nature, but he did not take a human person. Jesus can have a fully human nature without also taking a pre-existing human person. Not that his human nature ever existed on its own, it is a question about the hypothetical reality intended to give us insight into an actual reality. Heinrich uh, Hippe and his Reformed Dogmatic Space 416 also mentions this and he says the following, he says, The humanity taken upon the person of the Logos, then not a personal man, but a human man without personal substances. Uh, in other words, anapostasis is basically a very negative doctrine, uh, where it speaks of the singular personhood of Jesus Christ, uh, and it sort of gives us sort of a, a complex understanding that um, Jesus did not become a man in time, but he was already pre-existing, uh, and in his pre-existent, pre-incarnate form, took on human flesh. Uh, the next view, uh, David Mathis mentions, uh, when he writes about 
uh, the enfleshment of Christ is what is called the enepistasis. And he says the following. He says the doctrine of enepistasis gives uh, the answer to the human nature of Christ. His humanity is not only impersonal, anapostasis, but it's also impersonal, I-I-N, uh, impersonal. That is what anapostasis means, in that its personhood is in the person of the eternal second person of the Trinity. The fully divine Son is the person who took on fully humanity and remained the one person of the God-man. Uh, Fred Sanders, um, currently reading a book of him, and he's just absolutely exceptional, I really enjoy him writes the following about these two contentions, and I want to read this to you, and just follow. He says, uh, about any epistasis, and epistasis, he says, on the other hand, he says, the human nature of Christ is in fact a nature joined to a person, and therefore enapostatic, or personalized. But the person who personalized the human nature of Christ is not a created human person, like all the other persons personalized uh, the, by the actual human natures we encounter. Rather, it's the eternal person of the Trinity, so that the human nature of Christ is personal, but with the personhood from above. Very interesting. What are we saying? Let me just quickly summarize and say to you what Yusuf has sort of asserted. And he goes through and he tries to say, yes, these views and these uh, 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 hypostases of Christ is sort of incompatible uh, because we can look at human uh, uh, Jesus as human limitations and we can see that, you know what? That he was just a man. Uh, and if he was, uh, if he had one limitation, he would be limited and therefore he would not be God. Uh, scripture makes it absolutely clear that Jesus, for our sakes, became man. He limited himself. He became a servant according to Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. He, he emptied himself. Uh, he sort of put his divine prerogatives on hold for us to experience the full range of what it means to dwell with God and to experience the full life of God in our humanity. He became God uh, and one of the earliest church fathers said the following and it's not a, it's not a new age statement but to commune with us God became man so that man can become one with God, as God is, uh, said Anselm of Canterbury. But when we look at this, we see that uh, there's sort of the underlying idea that, that anything material uh, that God takes upon himself reduces God, uh, and, and that Jesus therefore is not God anymore because he took on sort of a humanity. Let me just say, nothing material can make God less God. Um, uh, also, flip side of the question, can anything material make God more than God? No. Uh, material things cannot make God any more God, because Christ um, was God in His fullness, therefore whatever, whatever He took upon Himself did not really enhance who He was, it just made Him more visible and appeared. And, and, and that is what Yusuf is missing, is that when we say, and when we speak of the biblical doctrine of the Incarnation, we do not say that Jesus in any way or form was marginalized uh, but we are saying that for our sakes, he became 100% uh, uh, man with us, dwelling with us, so we could experience the full revelation of what God was like. And that is a God I want. A God that comes so close to me that, that I can observe and see what, what, what this God is like. What an incredible God. It's not a God that's limited by nature, nor a God that gets depleted as Joseph observed. Uh, observes when he's when he becomes man this God is not so feeble and meek that he's merely absorbed that the moment he takes on human flesh that he loses his divinity that is not an omnipotent that is not an omnipresent and that is not the God of the Bible Thanks for watching once more and I just want to encourage you and say that if you enjoy these clips please subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, also go to our uh, Facebook page and subscribe and make sure that you receive all the little updates that we sort of give. Uh, also uh, please, please, please go to our website and visit it and also go have a look at the other clips which are also displayed on the website.